Hey, y'all, um, this morning we've got some special friends with us. Um, we, we've, we've known them forever, and um, it's so good to have them. They are the area directors, people over the whole world. But specifically, they focus their attention on Central America and the Assemblies of God. So they'll tell you more about that when they get up here. Um, I want you to know that what we're doing as a church is, um, and you might not get this because you don't answer the phone a lot, but my cell phone gets blown up all the time with missionaries calling about, hey, can I come share at your church? One reason they do that is because missionaries have to share in churches when they're home from the field. Like they, they, it's, it's like a requirement, isn't it? It's kind of like, yeah, like we're telling you. And so they, they call, and, and you can just hear it in their voices. It's like, please let me come. And so scheduling missionaries can be so difficult. On their end, you feel bad for them because they're making all these phone calls, and you know they're getting told no all the time. And then it, it feels bad on, on our end because it's like, when can we make that happen? So we've, be, we've become very intentional about this. And so what we're doing is it's not going to sound like a lot, but we're setting four Sundays aside every year, and those Sundays are just, we're just telling missionaries, the answer is yes. If you can get here, the platform's yours. Um, and so we'll, we'll take up to three missionaries on a Sunday, and that way potentially you get to hear from 12 people that are in 12 parts of the globe every year. Just hear what God's doing, right? Because, like, I mean, y'all, how many of you grew up in Albemarle? God's bigger than this place, right? I mean, we've been our whole lives going like, when do I get out of Albemarle? And God's like, I've been out. <laughs> like, he's still here too because he can be everywhere at one time. But, like, he's active in the world. And so I really want you to have um, regular times. And if it works out, we do it more than four times a year, that would be awesome too. We're just telling missionaries, hey, just, just let us know you're coming. And so uh, we, we connected over coffee a little bit ago, uh, a little bit. That makes it sound like it was this morning. It's a couple, couple months ago, and I was just like, hey, you should come. And so this was the date that worked out for him, and it was great. It was perfect. Um, and so Jay and Nancy, we've known them since we were youth, young youth pastors in Columbia, South Carolina. You thought it's going to say Columbia, but it's Columbia, South Carolina, home of the fire ants. <laughs> Man, alive. Fire ants and high humidity. It's terrible there. Um, but we've known them since we were there and just have watched how God is, you know, God always rewards faithfulness, right? You're faithful with a little bit, and he gives you a little bit more. And they've just been faithful at every step of the way, and God just goes, hey, have some more influence. And so now they'll tell you more about what they're doing. It's awesome. And um, I want you to give them a humongous gathering welcome as they come. Jay and Nancy Dickerson. morning. It is a real treat for us to be here. Um, well, we do love your pastors very much. Said yes, huh? Yeah, yeah, we're glad. We're one of the ones that, okay, we don't have to share with anybody else. You just got us today. So we're going to have to be really good, huh? <laughs> yeah, you better be. It is a treat to be here with our friends. And wow, you know, your kids have all grown up and beautiful and thank goodness you know mom and, and all that influence the strong genes and everything but it is a treat and um i'm glad the pastor said yeah i'm if he hadn't said yes we'd still be friends because i uh you know we pray for them and pray for 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 what they're doing we have the privilege of serving as area directors for about 110 missionaries throughout the seven countries of central america um we get to be with them and it, it is a a difficult year, you know, talking about mental health. We were sharing a few minutes ago about that as our missionaries have been in a very difficult time, different stages of lockdown, seeing friends who've passed away from the viruses. Uh, we've had national leaders in Nicaragua, our national treasure passed away, and in Guatemala, our national superintendent, as well as in Belize. In fact, yesterday uh, they were electing a, a new superintendent in Belize, and we were getting messages back and forth about what's going on. But the mental health of what missionaries, we do ask that you pray for them, uh, as you pray for, for, for pastors and leaders, because it has been um, a very tough time. And before you get it, that song was, that you wrote is a powerful song. And I was hearing it in Spanish, Tuyo so about the Lord singing. But one suggestion, going to the, to the world, change it to the nations. Um, just that one line of, uh, I want to take it to the world, 
take it to the nations. And I think that, that this church gathering, taking it to the nations, is an important thing through prayer, through going, and through giving, and all that, that you have a part of it. That really is a, um, I like that. That was a very, I meant to say something at the first service, but a very powerful song. And I am yours. That's what keeps us all sane in the middle of an insanity time, is that we are not alone. You know, it's easy to think about we're, we're hopeless. I've heard that. That's, oh, we are just so hopeless. When are things going to get back to normal? When, what's going to change? Who knows? But I know a God who's full of hope. And when I was reading in Romans chapter 5, this verse just gave me such hope. Um, Romans 5, verses 2 through 5. But it says that we're going to suffer. We don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear suffering because nobody likes to suffer. But we're going to suffer. We live in a world of sin. We're going to suffer. But when we dig into God and we persevere in the middle of circumstances beyond our control, his character is built in us. And through that character being built up in us, we are full of hope. And that's what we have seen. We got several pictures of things that have happened in our part of the world. We had two hurricanes that practically wiped out part of Nicaragua. We have had pandemic. 50% of the deaths in the pandemic have happened in, in Latin America, where only 15% of the population lives. We have seen a lot of devastation, but you know what? We're not without hope. Our, our, our missionaries have stayed safe. They've stayed well, and they've been able to reach people in weird ways. Um, we had one, one group of people that in El Salvador that called one of our missionaries and said, you know, we want to go to this community. It's a little ways out, but we just feel we need to get there and, and share with them Jesus. And we've got some clothes, but do you have any food? Is there any way that we could get some bags of food to take and, and minister? And so the missionary looked at, you know, what they had and what they could, could, could provide. And they came up with 100 bags of food and 100 bags of clothes. And they said, okay. We're going to take this out there. So this group got everything underneath the radar because nobody's supposed to be out. They got out to this community and said, you know, let's pray. We know this is not going to take care of all the needs in this community, but we need to pray and just ask the Lord to be with us. And they prayed. And they, let, they, they went door to door. They saw people get saved. They saw people healed. And at the end of the day, they were all excited talking about all the things that the Lord had done. And someone said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know what God did? They're like, yeah, yeah, healings. People gotten saved. I mean, God's been here with us. But that's not all. How many bags did we take out? A hundred. We gave out over 200 bags of food and clothes. How did that happen? God, we have hope. We are not without hope. We have seen in governments where there's, they've locked things down, they're not letting supplies and, and shipments in. We have seen doors open and containers come through to be able to feed thousands of people. God has blessed our missionaries to be able to put funds into the hands of pastors so that they've been able to buy food and supply the needs to people in their community. We are not without hope. God is on the throne. We've got a missionary who says, I'm praying for the COVID revival. He said, I don't want this time marked by COVID pandemic and the deaths and the things that we've all suffered or seen. He said, our God's bigger, and I'm pay praying for the COVID revival. He said, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen tells us what? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, and we live in a wicked world, then, when we do our part, then will we hear from heaven. Then will God turn the tides of what's going on in our country. It's time for us to pray for the COVID revival. So I invite you to join up with us as our missionary um, colleagues for the COVID-19 revival. Amen. Amen. Believe it for good things. It's kind of neat how, how coincidentally how things kind of work together, isn't it? You know, the pastor leads us in some worship this morning about revival. Wow. Isn't that just coincidence how God does that? And he talks about what God's speaking to him. And I, that, that the song of... of 
you know I'm being a little facetious. I have the, the Paul disease, a little a sarcasm is a gift, and um, some of us uh, have it better than others. But I believe that God has orchestrated today Amen. for each of you. When I was praying yesterday about this service and praying, I had never seen you, hadn't seen the building, but I felt like the Lord gave me a word for today. It, it is the word today. And I want to share around that because I believe that God wants to speak to us today. He knows us by name. I shared earlier. Today is my brother and sister's birthday. Two years apart. They're not twins. And I got to write to my older siblings and tell them happy birthday. But when I was young, my, my mother could never remember my name. It was like she'd call me Pat, Carol, whatever. And we swore we'd never do that with our kids. But anyway, the point is... My mom couldn't remember my name, but my God does. And maybe you've had your name forgotten before. Maybe it hasn't been like you didn't feel important. I want you to know that you are important and that God knew you would be here today, and he has a message for you. Now, I'm not the one to give it because I'm just not that good, but I do want to be a vessel that challenges you to hear the voice of God and respond to what he's telling you to do. One day we were walking through the Atlanta airport, and I was literally overwhelmed with the huge need of the world. We're 7 billion people. Only half of them have ever heard the name Jesus. How are we ever going to reach them? I mean, there is power in the name Jesus. When you're facing difficulties, uh, call out his name because he's there. I mean, say it together with me. Jesus. Jesus. There's power in that name. You can say my name and if you can remember it and have no power. But what do you cry out for if you've never heard the name Jesus? Isn't that overwhelming? It's like, what do we do? Well, it was, it was the Lord speaking to me that day, or I feel it was. It was like he was saying, when all God's people are doing all that God says, then all the world will be reached. See, you know, it's, it's amazing, each of us. You're not all called to be the pastor or this or that, but you are called to be what God has called you to be and to step out. So today, we want to challenge you to step out in faith. And it is fearful, but we sang about there's no fear, or there, we overcome fear when we're in His presence. And so today, we want to look at, at the Scripture in, in Joshua chapter 3. And I, I think you'll be able to see it. Where I'm going to share a couple of verses, then I'm going to tell a story and and it'll be like the pastor, have your electronics ready, wondering where he's going. But Joshua chapter 3, to set the story here, Joshua was now the leader, and he was about to have the children of Israel cross over the Jordan to go into the promised land. And in this passage of Scripture, we'll see what the Lord says. And I'm just going to share a couple of the passages. I encourage you to read the whole account. But in Joshua chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of the presence of God. And they were not going to move without the presence of God leading them. I am a to-do list person. I share this all the time. You know, I love to check things off of, you know, about all the stuff I've accomplished in a day. And if I don't have anything to accomplish, I'll make some stuff up and just cross it off so I feel good about myself. But serving God really is not about my to-do list or about what I'm wanting to do. It's about following the ark of the presence of the Lord. Well, that was what was leading them. And then verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3. Now therefore take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man, and with the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Now the picture here is, the miracle was not going to occur until they stepped into the water. And Pastor was talking early in devotion about priests and priest jobs. Well, I don't know if I'd be volunteering for the, for the head priest that day because you're the first one going to the water and you were going to sink if, if God didn't come through. What I want you to know is when God speaks to you, and I believe He speaks to His people, you don't know the end of the story and there is a potential for failure. Because the end of the story is not yours, it's his. As Pastor said, he's looking for people willing to go where he leads us. 
The backstory with Joshua is you know from early on, Moses came and he was deliverer of the children of Israel, brought them out of Egypt after all these plagues, all this stuff went on, and they were making the journey from Egypt towards the promised land, but the first obstacle they had to encounter was the Red Sea. Now, the numbers could be from several hundred thousand people to several million. I mean, the, you read all these. You, you can find, you know, a statistic to back up whatever you want it to, but I'm just going by what the Word talks about, the number of people. Huge group, and they're facing the sea, and God says he parts the water and the, line, the land is dry, and they all walk across. When they got to the other side, they left Egypt, and now they're getting ready. Moses was sending out 12 spies to the promised land to bring a report back. Can we go in now? Ten of them came back, and they were scared and said, they're too big, the giants, and we can't do it. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, at that time were men of faith and says, we can take them. But they chose to believe the ten. And so for 40 years, the children of Israel wandered in the desert till all that adult generation passed away before they would go in. And now Moses, who had been the man of God, who had had Joshua as his assistant. Now, if you read through the scripture, Joshua went into that holy place with with Moses as well. Uh, You know, it, it wasn't his story, but I just wonder at times, what did he see in the presence of God? Now, I've seen some, I've been in some exciting services as a, you know, seeing the power of God move. I, I've seen some tremendous things, but probably nothing like, like well, I mean, I think of, of, of in Capos when we were building a church and the power of God fell in such a tremendous way. We couldn't even move because the power of God was just so real. God was speaking. We were in a church that was half done. You thought Punta Gorda was bad? You have never seen anything to this church we were building in the southern part of Costa Rica. We were dedicating a building. Half the roof was on, half the, the floor wasn't even poured, and we didn't know if the lights were going to work. But the pastor said, do it so. We said, we'll just walk on over and Turned the lights on and they all came on and the power of God fell. And God spoke to me that time with that still small voice. This is what happens when you obey my voice. You get to experience my presence. Now, I don't want you to think that just obeying the voice of the Lord is just an easy piece of cake. Oh, God spoke. Let's go do it. Let's go walk in the water. There are times I shake in my boots when I hear the voice of God because it is... But you don't know where I'm going, do you, babe? Yeah. <laughs> blame God. Or I'll, I'll put the blame on somebody. But there are times when there is to obey the voice of the Lord. I think every time I've heard him speak, it's been nervous. It's been because I don't seem capable or able. I think that's how Joshua was feeling, even though he experienced the presence of God. And he was the heir apparent when Moses, Moses, did not get to experience the presence of the Lord because he disobeyed the voice of God. Now, I want you to think about that. Moses walked with God as no one else, but there was a huge responsibility. Now, he's with, the, he's with Jesus. He came, you know, he's, he's in heaven, but he didn't experience the promised land because of that disobedience. So Joshua saw that, and he understood that part, and now he was the leader. He was the man. He had it up here, but I don't believe he had it in his heart because now I have to do this task. So if you go into Joshua chapter 1 where he's starting and there's a relationship going on, there's some words going on, and if you'll allow me to read a couple of verses where God was speaking to Joshua, and he said this, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according all to the law that that Moses, my servant, commanded you. It goes on, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear. It was repeated four times in those few verses. God speaking to him, be strong and courageous. I don't think that God was affirming that he was a strong and courageous man. I think he recognized Joshua was scared to death, and he was letting him know, you are not going into this battle alone. I challenge you, if you hear the voice of God, he's challenged you to do ministry, new something, new whatever it is. Maybe he's speaking to you today because he wants to have relationship with you. I want you to know something, that Jesus loves you. 
We have heard too many messages about judgment. He wants to embrace you. I don't know where your heart is right now, but I know that God knows your name. He knows you're here today for a specific purpose. Joshua spoke. He heard from God. God said, in three days, you're going to see the power of God. He sent the spies to to Jericho. They came back, and they were ready. And now these verses that we, we read, he's at the point of, of seeing the mission fulfilled. And he was nervous, and God said, be strong. So he challenged the people. He said, we're going to see the power of God today. Today. And in verse 7 of chapter 3, this is the verse that the Lord really spoke to me yesterday for you. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Today was the day that the message would go from his head to his heart, and he would realize that, yes, I'm fulfilling the mission of God. But before that could happen, he had to step into the waters and take the step of faith. But what his step took What his step accomplished was not about him. It was about freedom for the Israelites so they could enter the promised land. Whenever we obey the voice of God, it's really not about us, but it's about bringing freedom. Freedom. John and Wilma Hall are missionary heroes of ours who are now in the presence of the Lord, but... They, um, at 65, got saved and said, we want to make our life count. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but we want to make our life count, so we're going to go in the mission field. So they went and they tried to learn Spanish. God bless them. They tried to learn Spanish. They went to Nicaragua. They worked, went, ended up in a, in a community, which, which is a garbage dump, a Kawalinka, outside of Managua, and they built a feeding center. But they started out just having kids' crusades on the street every day and all these kids would just come and listen to uncle john and aunt wilma and in the middle of all that god began to work in that community it would be told later some of the things that happened because of their obedience you see there was a lady who walked into the garbage dump one day and she laid her baby on the dump and she walked away and Little boys came to play that day, and they were out there, and all of a sudden they heard something, and one of them realized it was a baby and ran home. Mom, Mom, you got to come. There's a baby at the garbage dump, and and it's just laying there. you got to come get this baby. The mom went and picked that baby up, took her home, cleaned her up, fed her, and started loving on her. And it was going to be a couple of weeks before Grandmom realized that that was her daughter, I mean her granddaughter. And she went and knocked on that door, and she said, Um, I, that's my granddaughter that you've been caring for. And, and, and I just want you to know, I want to raise her. I want her to know that she wasn't thrown away, that she is loved, that she has family that loves her. And the lady said, well, here, please, take your granddaughter. So Josepha was raised in her grandmom's home. When Josepha was young, she'd hear the kids, oh, her mom's a prostitute. Oh, she doesn't know who her dad is. Not trying to be mean, but just tell them the truth. You know, kids can do that. And she got to school, and they'd kind of snicker and say, oh, she doesn't have a dad. She her mom's a prostitute. But one day, John and Wilma Hall had a group that came in to minister with them, youth that came. And they did a school assembly. And in this school assembly, they passed out the Book of Hope. They did puppets and all kinds of fun stuff, but they passed out the Book of Hope, which was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written kind of in comic book style so kids can understand it, with the message and a prayer salvation at the end. Well, they did a great program, and the message that Josepha heard that day was that Jesus loves you and he wants to be your father. And all of a sudden, her ears perked up. Jesus, he's my father. And they asked if anybody wanted to accept Jesus into their heart. And Josepha's hand went up. Yes. She accepted Jesus in her heart, ran home telling Grandmama, Grandmama, I have a father. I have a father. His name's Jesus. And it's all in this book. And they read the book of hope together. 
from that day on, things changed for Josepha because although she knew her mother was not a good woman, she continued to pray for her mama because then she wanted her mama to know who Jesus was, who this dad that she had now, she wanted her mom to know this. And so she prayed, oh, Lord, please save my mama. Please give me a chance to tell her about you. And her grandmother would say, honey, if your mom ever comes around, do not go anywhere with her. She's not good. Don't go anywhere with her. Josepha prayed for her mother every day. Well, when Josepha turned 13 years old, who would come up to the, the community but her mom? And she comes up to Josepha, Josepha, I'm your mom. Oh, <gasps> my mom. And immediately Josepha's thinking, God has brought her here so that I can tell her about Jesus. Her mom says, honey, come on, I want to take you downtown. Let's go get on the bus and we're going to, let's take a trip. And Joseph is like, okay, okay, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell her about mom. I'm going to tell her about Jesus. This is great. They get on the bus and they're headed into town. And someone goes and knocks on her grandmom's door and says, "Listen, Joseph has just taken off with your daughter. They're on a bus headed downtown." Joseph's grandmother immediately called the police and said, "You've got to intervene. I know the brothel that she's going to, and you've got to intervene. Please bring my granddaughter back." So the police got there just in time, just at the point of her being handed off to a man. The police entered and grabbed her, took her out, and took her back to her grandmother's house. Well, Josepha was just crying. Grandma, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. And her grandmother says, no, you shouldn't have, but I think you've learned your lesson. That night when Josepha got ready for bed, she pulled out her little piece of cardboard and she laid down on that dirt floor. And she says, Father, you saved me three times. You saved me on a garbage dump. You saved me when I was six years old and you became my father. And you saved me tonight. I will worship you forever. All I want to do is what you have for me to do. Josepha now has a youth group of about 150 in Nicaragua. In fact, she travels around Nicaragua and she preaches. You'll find her in that little community that John and Wilma Hall built a feeding center that feeds kids every day. And it's a, a place that kids can come in and get tutoring. And you'll find Josepha there on days that she can be there. She volunteers her time. And the minute she leaves, she's got kids walking right behind her, following her every step of the way. John and Wilma's obedience brought freedom to Josepha, and to scads of other kids throughout Nicaragua. We never know who we're going to impact. We never know what's going to happen when we are obedient. But I want to tell you something. Your obedience is freedom for someone. I love the story of Josepha. Um, Sometimes we need to bring her in so people can meet and see Josepha, the, the Pied Piper. But the story of John and Wilma at 65 leaving uh, what could have been retirement and said, we want to give the rest of our lives. They said yes to the Lord because they said yes. Um, Joseph and many others have come to know Jesus. It is tough when we obey. Uh, I've shared that. It's not for sissies. It, it will take time. But also knowing that God has a timing and when it all is going to occur. You'll hear the voice of God. And we think it's going to be tomorrow. Noah heard, yeah, it is Noah. I always want to call Moses in the ark. Anyway, Noah heard the voice of God to build an ark in the middle of a desert where they had no rain because there was going to be a flood. And he obeyed that voice, even though he didn't understand. He wasn't a boat builder, but it took 100 years before it was accomplished. Now, I'm not saying that what you hear from God is going to take you 100 years, but understand the Lord has a timing, and the Lord has a time for it to work in you. Well, we had to learn that or are still learning it. When we first started at Missions in Belize, we served there for eight years. We were involved in ministry. We were pastoring. We were leading schools. We were doing all kinds of things. And then the Lord spoke about starting a high school. We thought, high school? Don't missionaries plant churches? Well, we began to realize that only half the population of Belize can go to high school. What happens if you don't have the right grades or enough money? You're just kind of left at 13 years old and you're done. So God spoke to us about starting a project that would reach at least a number of the kids. We couldn't touch all of them. But we thought, okay, we've heard the voice of God. And we came back and we raised some support and, and went back. And we thought, it's going to just go work out great. Every time God speaks, it's always easy, right? No challenges. Well, 
we met some challenges. We had a piece of land. We started construction. And um, somebody came and said, what are you doing? We're building a high school. Why are you doing it on my property? I said, oh, no, it's mine. I have a piece of paper. He had a piece of paper, too, and his had more weight than mine did, so we lost. And so the government said, yes, you're right. You can sue us, but we have no money. But we'll give you another piece of land. We went through the process. They gave us a nice big hole, gave us acreage that you couldn't ever get to unless you had a helicopter. Every door kept getting shut in our face, and I said, Nancy, I'm tired of this. We're not looking for work. We have lots of ministry. So let's just put that high school, let's say, forget it. It wasn't God. It was a bad pizza or something. And Nancy said, that's fine, but what is the Lord saying? And I knew what God was saying. But there are times when he speaks and it's tough. So we continued on, and finally we saw how the Lord did work together. And, and we saw, maybe you can show some of the pictures of what's happening now. But we got to experience new hope. I can remember the first day that we drove up to the high school <clears throat> to open the, the school the first day and kids lined up waiting to get in to the, cause it was, we had a fence around it and kids waiting to get in and I was just crying that day thinking, oh God, this is wonderful. We, we thought we'd start that school with 45 students. That's the capacity that we felt like three buildings with, you know, 15 kids each. That would be good, a good start. Well, we had um, over 100 who applied the first day that we opened just to register kids. We thought, okay, Lord, there's definitely a need here. <clears throat> so we started the school with 99 students. So we were crammed in those three buildings. But I'm going to tell you, God did some amazing things. I had the privilege of teaching Bible and um, seeing those kids just accept the Lord and seeing their whole ability to dream just just change from being what they thought they were going to have to be or what their what their parents had been cane farm workers or mom just home and in the house they began to dream and think about the possibility in the future and watching these kids just come alive was just such an exciting time well to have the school and, and to allow as many kids to come as possible we also offered a work study program because there were the, the amount that you had to pay to come to the school was very, very little. But some families really could not even afford that. So we said, okay, how about a work study program? You can come a couple afternoons a week and do some chores around the school and pay off your bill. And parents were thrilled with that and kids were very willing to do it. We had one little girl named Elizabeth. She was a great student. Beautiful little girl, always with a smile on her face. Did her homework. She was just a great student. And she, had the work, she was part of the work-study program. And I had her last period. And I go, hey, Elizabeth, don't forget work-study today. Yes, miss, I'm going to be there. I mean, as soon as that bell rang and I had just laid eyes on her, she was gone. And I thought, my gracious, what in the world? A magic act. She can just disappear. This is crazy. We never said, okay, this is it. You're not coming. You're not paying your bill. You're out of here. And I don't know why we didn't at that time. But we learned later that um, Elizabeth, her mom was, was, had a man who lived in their home. And he paid the rent. And he put food on the table. And he felt like it was his right to abuse her every afternoon. And she was told, you will be home as soon as that bell rings. You are to be home. And that's exactly, I mean, Elizabeth was home every afternoon. It's a horrible story, but the only way that Elizabeth could get re released from that was to be able to graduate from high school, be able to get a job, and be able to leave home. Our obedience in building and following through on that high school brought freedom from Elizabeth, because the truth is, Elizabeth never wanted to leave. She just stayed at New Hope all the time. That was a refuge for her. We had students that this, this happened to. But in the midst of that, God did some incredible things in the lives of our students, and we see them in Belize and what they're doing today. But what if we had said, you know, well, this isn't it. I'm not doing anymore. I'm tired of fighting the government. I don't want to have to go through this anymore. Our obedience brings freedom. We're at another one of those what if uh, situations. Um, several years ago, we were back in Belize. We get the privilege of going there regularly. We met with the superintendent. They had just gone through a 
difficult, a crisis time in their national leadership. Um, it's pretty accepted in, in Belize uh, because of uh, moral situation that many men have a sweetheart on the side as well as their family. Unfortunately, it's entered the church, and so we had some pastors who were living in immorality, national leaders, and it affected them tremendously, as well as someone borrowing some money that, that wasn't theirs. And the superintendent said, we have a crisis, not in leadership skills, but in the heart of leadership. Do you understand the difference? And so God has spoken to us. In fact, he asked us, we need help. But we've got to go down to the high school level. We've got to go down to younger people and train them and challenge them to be disciples of Christ. It's not just your leadership ability. Because we, we're not lacking leaders. We're lacking character. And so God has spoken to us about starting a program we're calling Project Accelerate. To start a boot camp, we're building some, doing some work, some facilities, some training, and maybe bring some youth. And just, I'm just, just saying, God speaking, leading, who knows? Maybe the gathering needs to gather there. Um, you know, anyway, uh, I'll quit meddling and go to the next thing. But we're at a what if because, you know, it's like, okay, God, you speak to, the, to someone else. But God is challenging us to start a new program, something new and different that we've not done before. And we're going to be challenging, asking young people to live a life of purity in a culture that mocks purity. We're going to ask young people to be, live lives of integrity where they're taught to just don't get caught. And so it's something new and different. We're writing curriculum. We're getting ready to build some, some obstacle, all kinds of things, obstacle courses. Um, it's out of our wheelhouse, but what we do have is we have the voice of God. And we're hearing the voice of the Lord because we're at that, that point of being getting in the water, being scared, and God saying, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. So would you pray with us as we start this new project, Project Accelerate? We're at the Jordan River ready to step in. We look back when we started the high school, lack of resources, time, and, and all the ability but what we did have the voice of God. But I want to bring it to you right now. I believe that God spoke when he said today. It was a message for every person, both service, those who are listening, wherever you are. God is speaking to you about today. And I don't know what that today is for you. I don't know if it's giving your heart to Jesus. I don't know if it's new ministry. I don't know what it is. But I know that I believe with all my heart that God has a message and wants to speak to each of us. And so as we, we close our time together... I want to ask you to listen to the voice of God. And before we do that, Nancy, one, a lot of times, you know, you're going to be having missionaries this year. We, we, want to, we want to give you three Ps about how to pray for missionaries. Yeah. We would love for you to take a prayer card before you leave. Um, we'll be we'll the back door, there, and, and <clears throat> we'll, we'll gladly give you one to pray for us. And we do ask you to pray the three Ps for all missionaries. Um, but the first is presence. We kind of feel like Moses. Lord, if your presence is not going with us, we don't want to go. We want to stay right here until we know that your presence is leading us and guiding us. So pray for us that the presence of the Lord would lead us every step of the way. Second thing is praying for protection, that God would keep us safe from all the things going on, but also our missionaries. One of them recently was held up at gunpoint because they had food. They weren't upset with the people. They're safe, but they realize people are hungry and starving. So it is a very difficult time. But pay, pray for protection. And the third thing is provision. We, we, we're going, we, we are embarking on this new journey, and we're right at the river. And, and we're like, okay, but, Lord, you can, we can see all the obstacles. That, and, and we all do that. You look at your checkbook each month, and you're paying your bills, and you're going, but, Lord... Um, and we do the same thing. And we're like, okay, Lord, you provide. You provide for us to get back to Costa Rica. You provide for us to be able to continue with Project Accelerate in Belize. And so if you would just pray, yeah, this isn't too big for God. Um, sometimes I'm very limited by what I see. But God says, uh-uh, it this isn't you, it's me. So just pray with us that the Lord would just provide and that we would just not doubt and keep walking through. But as we close, we said, we want to pray over you. But I don't know what the word today means to you. But my challenge is, what is God speaking to you today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I 
I am very limited in my thinking, limited in my ability. But I believe you had every person here who's listening on your mind when, when you spoke that very clearly to me of today. Maybe for some of us, the t- today of salvation. Maybe somebody needs to recommit their heart to you. Maybe for some others, they're like us at the Jordan River and getting ready to step in. And it's, it's fearful, Lord. We need to hear that. Be strong and courageous, realizing we will not be alone. But, Lord, I do pray for, for the others who are wrestling with some decisions they need to make. That, God, we won't make our decisions based on the ease or knowing the answer. But our decisions will be based on listening to your voice, doing what you say, and knowing that our yes means freedom. Use us, Jesus, we pray. May we be part of that all who, when all the world is doing all that God says, then all the world will be reached. We thank you, Jesus, for knowing us by name and calling us by name that this is today. In Jesus' name we pray. That was so good. Thank you so much. They're going to be in the lobby. Um, make sure that you stop by and, and share with them. If God moves on your heart, man, to support them in ministry, 100% you should do that. No doubt about it. Um, it's an honor to have you all here. Okay, everybody sit up straight. Look at me. Kids, you've done fantastic. Tell your parents to pay attention for one more minute. I, I need to do this, okay, you guys at home as well. Um, has zero to do with y'all did a fantastic job, but just need to be obedient to what God told me. So I, I just noticed maybe it's because I was in two services, but the words disobedience and obedience came up a lot. I really need you to pay attention to me because this is really important. So we don't serve a God who, when we disobey him, starts throwing lightning bolts at us. This is very important. I'm not sure who it's for. We serve a God who, because he loves us, tells us if you go that way, you're going to find yourself in things that will hurt you. He's not hurting us. He's warning us. If you come this way, you'll find yourself in blessing, which is what we just heard them talk about. Obedience leads to blessing. I'm saying that because I really felt a check like in my heart, like I've got to say this to clear that up because there are people, especially in the Bible Belt, y'all, who believe that if I do the wrong thing, God is going to kill me. And what God's saying is, if you're doing the wrong thing, you're headed towards death. I'm not killing you. You're headed that way. And I want you to be obedient so you can step into blessings. Does that make sense? Now listen, if that, if that resonates with you, then we might want to pray about that. Okay, so I'm going to pray us out of here, and then I'm going to kind of hang out a little bit here. And you just nonchalantly walk up and go, that was me, let's pray. Okay, and we'll pray. But I think that's so important. All right, and if you guys are at home, you can shoot me a text or a message or whatever. We'll pray for you as well. All right, come on. Thanks so much, God, for today. Um, Man, I I love Jay and Nancy. I love their heart, their passion for souls, God, for the kingdom. And I'm so thankful, God, that we, we were allowed to have them here today. What an honor, God, to hear from them what you're doing in another part of the world that many of us may never get to, although some will go on a mission trip there, I'm sure. But we got to hear about what you're doing, how your kingdom is growing there. And we just, as a, as a body right now, not as the pastor, as a body, we bless them. We just pray your blessings on them, God. As, as they take steps of obedience into that that river, God, into that next thing you've called them to. I just pray your blessings because they're walking in the direction that leads to blessing. Doesn't mean it won't be hard stuff that they deal with, but ultimately, God, your blessing is in that place. And so we just prayed over them, God. Pray you um, take care of them, provide all that they need, pr- protect them, God, we ask, and give them your presence. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.